angels, winged creatures in the sky, glowing white auras around them, peaceful creatures, but do they all look like that? Do they sometimes take on more ordinary forms, like the old man at the park, or the hitchhiker on the side of the road? Grab a blanket, turn off your lights, and let's take a look at four true amazing angel encounter stories. Because the angel you see may just be your guardian angel protecting you. My Angel From an early age, I've been terrified of the dark. Not because of the things I can't see, but of the things I can see. Forms of humans and creatures sitting in the shadows. Forms of faces sitting so clearly at the end of my bed, waiting for me to fall asleep. I had always assumed that most young children experience these images due to the mind playing tricks on you, but one particular night changed this belief. It may be that what we think is just figures of our imaginations are actually real. The first time I experienced a ghostly encounter was several years ago in 2002. When I was 11, my family and I were living in a small log cabin house in Sarnia, Queensland. We lived in the house for over two years. It was in the fourth month in which I came to believe that the house contained some form of ghost or spiritual energy. It was late at night, around 10 or 11 p.m. I was trying to sleep but wasn't getting far with my attempts. I decided to turn my light on and see if I could fall asleep that way. When I had covered myself with my blankets, I turned on to my right side, which faces to the door to try to help me sleep. I had been looking at the door for about 10 minutes when a female figure stood at the doorway. Originally, I thought it was my mom, but then I realized that she was wearing some weird 1800s dress and while she appeared to be solid, she had a weird tinge of red overall on her body. Before giving me a minute to figure out who she was, she turned my light off and started to hover and glide towards me. Just before reaching my bed, I noticed that she was glaring at me. She made me feel very uncomfortable, like, like I couldn't trust her. Before I got a chance to scream, she disappeared quicker than she had appeared. About a minute after she disappeared, a man, also dressed like he was from the 1800s, appeared. Unlike her, he had a strange white glow around him, and I had a weird sense of safety and protection. Just before he vanished, he turned my light back on and smiled at me. This went on for months afterwards. This strange game of cat and mouse carried on each night. He got rid of her faster and each night he came closer to me. The last time I saw them, he sat at my bed and smiled at me. He made me feel like somehow everything was going to be okay and then he left. I'm not sure why I saw him then and why I can't see him now but I can feel his presence with me all the time. Sometimes I feel him touching my shoulder or my back, whoever he is or what I like to think of him as my guardian angel. For years I've tried to learn about who he is and what he is, but nobody seems to help me. If anyone believes they know, please don't be afraid to contact me. Guardian Angel? 
I believe this story to be a true ghost experience. One that may be checked out by someone with complete knowledge of a place called the Bras. I leave this to the readers to decide. This happened over 30 years ago, when my youngest son was about five months old. We had taken all three of our boys to visit family in Scotland. After a lovely visit, we left it much later to leave for home than we should have done. We thought they would sleep throughout the long journey if we left in the early evening, so we set off at about 7.30 p.m. and all seemed well. In those days, the bras was the only way to Scotland, and it was a narrow road going on for many miles over desolate rolling hills, smattered very rarely, with the odd distant farmhouse approachable by trekking over several fields, totally exposed to the changing weather conditions. Having traveled this way many times, we were happy to set off late, and as darkness fell, the boys, then aged five, seven, and five months, snuggled down under their quilts in the back of the car. After some time, a heavy fog descended, and we could barely make out the road ahead. There were no lights, and we slowed down appropriately. Then we saw the oil warning light flash on the dashboard. The car began to lose speed. We chugged on, very worried as we were miles from anywhere. Things got worse, and as the road was almost invisible by now, we couldn't see anything in front of us. We were totally alone in the rolling mist. Eventually, the red light stayed on and we lost more speed. We were barely moving, in fact. At one point, my husband suggested pulling up and trying to walk for help. That was definitely not happening. Silently praying that we would get to safety, neither of us spoke. We couldn't pull up as the road was a single carriageway and it was too dangerous in the fog. After what seemed like ages, we turned in the road. There, in the middle of nowhere, a beacon of light shone to our left. We rolled from a roundabout into a service station and the car cut out. After filling up the car with oil, we asked the man if there was anyone who could fix it. He said it would take until morning by the time he called someone out. We decided that if the car started up again, we would try to set off again. It did and we rolled slowly away. We made it home at about 3 a.m. and as we pulled up to our driveway, the car cut out and refused to start again. Where is the ghost story, you ask? Well, it was a miracle that the service station appeared out of nowhere right at the moment the car stopped. We had prayed so hard for help, the point being, we had never seen this place before on the many times we had traveled that road, nor did we ever see it again. We believe it was a ghost station. We asked family and friends if they were aware of the place and nobody was. We believe that we were helped by a guardian angel. I know it sounds so far-fetched, but we never found it again on that road. Was this a ghost or an angel that saved me? I do know that a light comes to take people's souls into the afterlife when they are close to death or have died. When I was about eight years old, I was drowning when I jumped into a body of water which I thought was shallow and I went down the bottom of the deep trench. I was by the trench with some relatives who were fishing and I thought that area was shallow by the narrow side of the trench. After looking at my relatives standing in the wide area and they seemed to be okay, but of course, they were taller and older than I was, and the smaller area of the trench was so deep that I just went down and floated away. 
I could actually feel the current of the water taking me away from my relatives as I went deeper and deeper into the trench. At this time, I do not know how long I had been under the water, but a big bright yellow light was shining on me, and if you look into it, it, it looks like a big long yellow tunnel filled with light. When I was in this light, I felt so happy and on to this day I cannot explain why I was so happy. I guess the light is supposed to make people feel extra happy so you can forget all your worries. The light just makes you feel like you want to go in and never return or think about anything else. It was a feeling of going with the flow of happiness which means going into the light. I also had to stay in the light because when I looked behind me, it was so dark and there was water all around me. I was also afraid of how dark and dainty it looked behind me, and I was afraid that I was going to drown in that body of water behind me. Suddenly, a white female with red hair and a long white dress emerged from the light, and I thought she was a mermaid, and she was probably going to hurt me and I was afraid. However, I did not see her feet, but she looked rather slim, tall, and her hair was about shoulder length, and she was really pretty. She was about 19 or 20 years old, her white dress was short-sleeved, and the neck was square-cut, not round. I guess this female sensed the terror in me, and she told me not to be afraid. She scooped me up and moved so quickly with me that I felt like she was rocking me and trying to get me up the water. At this time, I could hear my relatives talking, and she told me to put my hands up. I guess she wanted them to see me so that they can help me out of the water. I've told few people about this experience. About three years ago, when my mom passed away, I asked one of the ladies at my mom's funerals about the incident, and I told her that something happened to me while I was in the water. She ended up telling me that I was only in the water for about five minutes, and they pulled me out. Anyways, maybe 5 minutes is still way too long for a child to be underwater with no air and I guess I was dying and the light came to me to take my soul or to help me out. I'm glad that I was helped instead because my family would have been really upset if I passed away in that body of water. I've been upset with my cousins for many years now for not saving me earlier. But I guess it's it's not their fault. I was washed away in that deep water. It's not their fault they couldn't locate me sooner. I am not bitter with anyone, but I do think about the woman in the light, and I truly believe that she was the only one who truly saved me. Whoever she was, whoever she is, I will always be thankful to her, and I will never forget her. As you can guess, I do believe in the light and I'm 100% convinced that it comes for people upon their brink of death or at death. The prayer I have used to exercise my apartment was my personal prayer which has worked for me. I guess the spirits of my apartment was cooperative and they listened to my prayer and maybe the angels helped them to cross over as well. I've heard about spirits who do not want to cross over and their stories are pretty bad. After watching a show on YouTube where Mary Ann Winskowski was the host, I have learned that spirits have about 80 hours to cross over into the light, and if they have missed the light, then they will have missed it. But there are other options for them to get to the light again, where they can go to a funeral home and get the light there. Usually the light will be at the funeral home to cross over deceased people. Mary Ann Winskowski has paranormal experiences with ghosts or spirits. She has written so dead when ghost speaks and as alive. She lives in Ohio, US. Miss Winskowski is paid to attend funerals where relatives have a last conversation with their loved ones and she stated on her YouTube show that spirits have 80 hours to cross over into the light and if they have missed their opportunity, they cannot cross over unless they go to a funeral home. However, I've used my own personal prayer to cross over the spirits in my home, and so far, I haven't had any further incidences with them.
The Cat and the Angel It was May of 2003, and I had spent a year in the darkest recesses of my mind, nursing a broken heart. I had suffered three traumatic blows, one after another. First came the loss of a good job, right before Christmas 2001. I kept telling myself and two children that things would be okay, but tried as I might, I could not find work, not even as a waitress. The economy had gone so bad. In January of 2002, not two weeks later, my son passed, having taken his own life. I'm the one who found him, performed CPR, even though I knew it was too late. I beat myself up emotionally for that, for a long time, feeling that I had failed. Somewhere during that time, our cat, Simba, disappeared. One day, I focused long enough to realize that I could not remember the last time I had seen our 13-year-old furball. Even though he was supposedly my cat, he was very attached to my son. I thought maybe he had gone looking for his human. Add to all of this, our home had fallen into foreclosure and I had to give our dog away. So it was. I found myself and my daughter downsizing from a 10-room house with three-fourths acre lawn to a tiny two-bedroom apartment. We sold off quite a bit of our belongings, but I steadfastly clung to a plaster garden angel that was my son's last gift to me. A cherub sitting on a pile of rocks, reading a book as a squirrel and rabbit perched on either side of his lap. It stands nearly two feet tall and has some heft to it. I had no idea where I would put it, but I wrapped it in a towel to prevent any chipping and loaded it into my car myself. That angel meant a lot to me. I remember when he bought it, saying I deserved it. I deserved something nice. I stood in that house, saying goodbye to what had been the only home my son could remember, the place my daughter had been born, and felt hollow, defeated. Except for my daughter, whom my ex was trying to take away as he blamed me for our son's death, I felt I had lost everything of any importance. I touched the woodland murals I had painted in my son's room, and blinking back the tears, whispered to my son that if he could hear me, if that was really him I had glimpses of, that he should come with me or grow into the light. I did not believe, as opposed to my upbringing, that suicide automatically sentenced you to hell, not if God was truly just. After all, he knows the big picture, right? I think the why part plays a big part of his decision. Anyways, that's when I heard the weirdest meow coming from outside. Next door, they had these thorny bushes that always seemed to be ensnaring small dogs and cats, and it was there I found this weird calling to. About two feet away, I began talking. My usual, don't hurt me and I won't hurt you babble, as I reached for the gloves my neighbors were kind enough to leave there for me. Funny, I have no fear of four-legged beasties, but they were terrified of them, so they left these long gloves for me to wear as some protection from bites or scratches. I squatted down on my haunches and began parting the bush. The real trick was keeping the animal, usually someone's pet, calm enough to allow me to disengage the bush from their collar without them strangling themselves. I saw familiar golden amber eyes looking at me. Simba? No, impossible. But it was. After being gone for about a year, on the day of the move, here he was. I had to be sure, so I said in a very stern voice, Get your furry butt back up on our porch now. He shot out of that bush and up onto the porch, then looked at me like, Miss me much? So Simba came back, 
and seemed to understand that the apartment was his new home and he never tried to leave it. In fact, he'd bat at my daughter's younger cat, about a year old, if he tried for the door as if to say, hey buddy, you don't want to do that. I unloaded my car and could not find the angel. It wasn't there. It wasn't in the apartment. I looked high and low. Where could a two foot tall statue hide in a place that made a shoebox look big? I called people who had helped me move, but no one had seen it. It hadn't surfaced when I curled my weary body into bed with Simba curling up next to me. Of course, the first night in a new place, you're going to hear sounds. Weird sounds. I'd left a lamp on in the living room, and the light dimly lit part of the room. Not a lot, but enough I wouldn't break a toe if I got up and had to navigate the still unfamiliar apartment. I distinctly heard the word, Mom. And I sat bolt up in my bed. I knew that voice. Silence. I convinced myself I had imagined it, or perhaps sound carried from another house. I laid back down. A few moments passed. Mom. Listen. I can't describe the odd, hope, heartbreak, longing, achiness that filled me hearing my son's voice as Simba came into alert position cocking his head as if he heard it too. The angel is in the game box. I put it there. Dad's having mean thoughts, but it'll pass. I whispered his name. I could still smell him in the air, but just as quickly, it was gone. Game box, I thought. What game box? We hadn't had one since the kids turned into teenagers, but they had used my old wooden chest as one. I got out of bed and practically ran to it. I flung it open and emptied it, mostly linens and a few breakables I hadn't unpacked yet, but no angel. Crazy, I murmured to myself. You've gone totally round the bend, I decided. Since I was up, I may as well put the mess away properly. Placing the linens in the closet, I spied the box I had labeled games. I knew that's all that was in that box, board games, and a few outgrown toys that I could barely bear to part with. Sentimental reasons, I guess. <sighs> May as well empty that box too. That box was packed in layers, games on the bottom, and assorted toys on top. I had packed that box, I remember my daughter laughing at me because I placed the games alphabetically. Yet somehow, at the very bottom, was the angel. I lifted it out and hugged it to me. Maybe I imagined it, but I thought... I felt my son hug me in that moment too. <laughs>